we'd like to thank you for giving up your evening uh, tonight. Um, our, we're holding this session a little bit later than normal because um, our special guest tonight is joining us from the United States and there's a big time difference. So ra rather than getting George up at three o'clock in the morning, we thought it'd be only fair to uh, have our session a little bit later. Um, before we get into our topic tonight, which is exploring mindfulness, we just thought we'd like to give you an update on the team. Um, this week we've very tentatively returned back to the office. Um, a big thanks to Sue, who's um, put in place all the necessary requirements to sh ensure that we're as safe as possible. Um, we haven't as yet um, started or restarted face-to-face -face client meetings in the office, um, uh, but um, we, we are going to sort of keep you updated on that and when we sort of, if there's any changes to that, we'll, we'll keep you updated. And we really want to thank you for your patience during this period, because I know it's been difficult for everyone. Uh, it is a little bit of a watching brief at the moment, but um, we will keep you updated. Um, you may see that I'm now safely back from Kenya and completed my two weeks quarantine. Um, Dom is also safely back from France and he's completed his unexpected two weeks quarantine because uh, they seem to change the rules when he was away. Um, but uh, we're, all, we're all getting back to some sort of normality now. Um, it's, my, it's my great pleasure to introduce our guest, um, our special guest tonight. George Kinder is known as the father of life planning. Uh, he's changed the way the world thinks about finance and how financial planning is delivered. Um, I believe one day about 30 years ago, George was sat in his office of his accountancy financial planning practice thinking, how his profession was so focused on numbers, uh, tax savings, investment returns. And whilst he recognised all of these things were really important a part of financial planning, he felt the most important part of that was missing. And that was the people behind the money. George recognised that their dreams and aspirations were far more important than the money itself. Uh, it doesn't sound like rocket science, but it's, it's far too often missed in uh, in the financial planning practice. So he started his 30 year, 30 year journey to change the life of the people that he worked with and help them find the freedom that they were looking for. His mission was to help them lead totally fulfilled lives in every way. Not satisfied with this, George wanted to share what he discovered through his own practice and he established the Kinder Institute of Life Planning to train other financial professionals um, and help them really understand what's most important to the individuals that they work with. George has now trained, I believe, nearly uh, well over 3,000 financial professionals in the US, United Kingdom, Netherlands, India, and many other countries around the world. Um, Dom and I came across George's work about 10 years ago when we, um, we were becoming increasingly dissatisfied uh, in general in the way that financial planning was being delivered in the UK and we we both felt there was a much better way that it could be done. Uh, we both trained with the, the Kinder Institute and we both became registered life planners um, and it was instrumental in the way we deliver financial planning to the families that we look after. But there's so much more to George. He's the author of three books on finance, along with books on mindfulness, meditation, he has a keen interest in photography and poetry. The New York Times and the Wall Street Journal have both put George's financial books on their recommended reading lists. And in George's latest book, The Golden Civilization, The Map of Mindfulness, he challenges the status quo of how large organizations and government control. He asks us to question ourselves what a golden civilization might look like, what we might need to change and what contribution we can make to make a better world for future generations to come. George believes a person really only knows what matters, uh, what, what makes them, uh, only a person really only knows what makes them tick, or in George's world, what lights their torch, is when they can tap into their true potential and deliver to the world what the world deserves. A large part of this is um, understanding how we can be completely in the present moment at any time. Something that many of us really struggle to achieve in the busy lives and the busy worlds that we live in today. So the importance of mindfulness is something that we're talking about more and more in recent times. 
especially as we've been through periods of lockdown and quarantine, etc. So to help us explore this topic, um, I'd like to welcome George Kinder. Hi, George. Uh, I hope I've clever covered your glittering CV. Um, is there anything you'd like to add, or have I covered it all? I think you've covered it all, Jonathan. It, it's just that's just great. Uh, I mean, I mean, maybe the only other thing I would add around mindfulness is that um, we. It is about the present moment, but one of the ways that I framed it for financial advisors and for people in general is that it's tremendously about listening to ourselves. And in a, in a very uh, profound way, a deep way, uh, and, it, and the world could use a lot more listening, a lot better listening. Uh, each of us could uh, all over the world if we're to make a better place and to uh, make better families and better communities. Fan, fantastic and, and that's what we're here to explore today George we're, 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 we're going to look at mindfulness what it means the importance of it in our lives um, and how we can practice and what impact it will have on us if we're able to to practice it a bit more and I believe a bit later on you're going to lead us in a meditation session so we can experience mindfulness in practice um, I'd just like to say to the audience out there, um, the Q&A is now open, so please, we want to, to make this an interactive session, so please um, uh, add your questions to the Q&A. Harry's going to be picking those up, and we'll get a chance to look at those later on. But George, to get us kicked off, can you explain to us what mindfulness means to you? Well, um, gosh, it's such a big topic to me, but it is, I mean, it's huge. And uh, mindfulness, the way I think of it, I, I think of three domains of freedom that we have access to in our lives and that are very important for us in our lives. One of them is the kind of life planning work uh, that I know you've done with, with your clients to make sure that um, uh, the people that you work with are on target with what they're passionate about, what, what's most meaningful to them, so that their lives are really fulfilled. Uh, and they're working on all cylinders and the money's being used to make that happen. So um, what mindfulness, mindfulness takes us uh, to a, a deeper uh, place of freedom inside of ourselves, where we let go of all the um, systems of analysis, all, the, um, uh, all, the, all of our thinking, we let go of it and we look at what is it like to just be here in the present moment. You know, the old thing about smelling the roses, allowing ourselves to stop. And so it's a, it's a, the great thing, the amazing thing about it is that it's a specific training to actually um, strengthen our ability systematically throughout our lives to be more and more here, to be more alert, to be more alive. Uh, to be better listeners, to be more empathic, all of these things come out of it. And the technique is very simple. It's just simply letting your thoughts go at every moment and coming back and paying attention to the sensations of breathing, either at the nostrils or at the belly. Thousands of studies have been done on its benefits and they're, they're amazing, really. And mm. Anything else? Ah, well, um, I mean, the benefits are, are quite extraordinary, Jonathan. The, uh, most people start mindfulness practice because they've heard that it uh, is kind of a, a de-stressor. It reduces the stress in your life, the anxiety in your life, frustrations in your life. And that's certainly true. That's enormously true. But um, what people don't realize, and all these studies have revealed it, uh, one of the things I tell my teenage daughters is that it'll make you smarter that your tests to get into college, you'll actually have uh, test scores that will go up 15 to 30%. And that's one of the things that happens. And the reason for it is that you're, one of the things that it's training is your ability to focus. And, and so you're, again, back to the present moment, your ability to be here. And one of the things, of course, that happens when we're tested is that we're distracted and we can't think and all that kind of stuff. So it, it raises your test scores. Um, but it, it, it uh, improves your capacity to listen to others. Uh, it improves your kindness. It, it lengthens your telomeres, which are part of your, the cell structure uh, in your body. And that lengthening of the telomeres is a sign of greater longevity. So many people think that it will um, 
uh, improve your longevity, which all of us are concerned with right now with COVID lurking around the corner. Absolutely, fantastic. And, and of course, this is a challenge to me because I'm trying not to think about the next question that I'm ask, ask, going to ask you whilst I'm listening to, to, to what, what, what you're talking about. But um, it's interesting to me because if I go back five years, the topic of mindfulness probably didn't particularly appear on the radar, but it seems to become topic has become in the last few years become so much more topical why, why do you think that is why 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 are we talking about it and why can we talk about it in the in the wider domain much more these these days than we have in the past yeah well it, it started as, as many movements do in, in a small circle of people and uh, a lot of them had gone to india and learned different meditation practices uh, and that was many many years ago what happened over the last 10, 20, 30 years was a slow and steady accumulation of scientific studies on exactly what mindfulness does to the brain and how it benefits the body. And in the last few years, that the accumulation of that scientific evidence has gathered such, uh, such force, like a snowball growing larger and larger. It's grown uh, so large and so significant that um, newspapers have reported on it uh, all over the place. Teachers have begun to teach it in schools. Uh, even I think in the Houses of Parliament, you have a, there's a, a room that's dedicated to mindfulness practice, and God knows the politicians need it. Um, but we, we all need it, and it helps us all in, in many ways. So I think science has helped. It used to be thought of as, oh, meditation is this weird thing from the East. But what, what's happened is that it's become secularized. We've realized that it's just a, a practice. It's just a, a, a practice that we apply in the mind. It's just like learning, exercising mind muscles the way, the way Dom loves to exercise his bike, you know, biking muscles. And, um, and all the studies have shown that the effects are incredible, just incredible in terms of vitality, in terms of peacefulness, in terms of kindness uh, and longevity and health. health. Well, that, that, that leads nicely into, into my next question, which was, um, uh, and you've touched on a few of them there, but could, could you elaborate a little bit more on, on um, why you feel practicing mindfulness, mindfulness is so important in life and what benefits it can bring, bring to us? Yeah, um, the, uh, one of the things that I did in, in uh, my mo most recent book, uh, the most recent book is called A Golden Civilization. It has a subtitle called the map of mindfulness. And um, one of the things that I was concerned about uh, as we look at that domain of freedom, which is our relationship in, out into the world, uh, into markets and into democracy and time and space and all the rest, is that we've seen a striking lack of virtue, of integrity. And we've seen a polarization. You're seeing it right now hugely in America. It's scary. To the world because we've stood so much for democratic freedoms. Uh, but of course, you went through your own version of it with the, the Brexit uh, uh, deal. So um, one of the things that mindfulness does is that it actually brings more, uh, you could call it character, but you could also call it virtue into our lives. Because as we practice paying attention to the present moment, we're noticing that the way we wander from that is we wander because we're neurotically or anxiously or frustratingly thinking about other things. And those, uh, and those things make us anxious or frustrated. So we're bringing anxiety and frustration to peace. We're cultivating patience. We're cultivating a kind of kindness toward ourselves or forgiveness toward ourselves for wandering in that way every time we come back. So we're actually building um, kind of uh, structures of uh, a virtue inside of ourselves that, are, um, that we, we then bring into the world. We need that right now. I mean, it's a kind of listening. That, uh, I call it a kind of listening. So just doing it itself, if the world, if all the world did it, we'd have much more kindness. There'd be a lot less polarization in the world uh, just from that act alone thank you thank you um you, you touched on something there and you i think you used the the the, the words um being in the present moment 
Um, can you talk a bit more that about that? And um, and why is it so hard for us to actually be in the present moment? Yeah. I, I know sometimes, like if I'm on the golf course and I'm playing a few holes, my mind is going to what's waiting for me in the office when I get back, say, for example. What, what, talk a bit more about the present moment and why is it so difficult for us to stay in that place of the present moment? Yeah. It's an amazing thing, Jonathan, the present moment. I, I've dedicated a lot of my life and a number of my books to exploring what, what the present moment really is all about. Um, uh, it, it, uh, um, there's, there's a number of, of scientific studies about this that are quite extraordinary. One of them by Daniel Gilbert, who is the most popular professor at Harvard, uh, on this, and he teaches a course on the psychology of happiness. And that scientific study that he did with a guy named Matthew Killingsworth showed that if we are, if we're in the present moment, the odds are that we're happy. And if we're not in the present moment, like thinking about going back to the office and what you, your to-do list is, the odds are we're not happy. And it's much more about that present moment than it is about being on the golf course or being in, in Cornwall or, or Maui or whatever versus being in the office. It's much more about, are we in the present moment? And what's interesting is that um, being in the present moment is very difficult. Uh, there have been books written about the flow, so to speak. But in fact, if you, you know, when you try to practice mindfulness, you realize that um, something happens every moment you come back to the breath it, it like it it uh, catapults you back into your thoughts into your stories uh into your frustrations into your daily issues uh, so it can throw you back into emotional situations or just to-do lists that's the nature of time the nature of the present moment is that it, it's impossible to kind of tackle it it's the most powerful thing in the world. It's more powerful than the atom. It's more powerful than the sun because you can't hold on to it. You can't tame it. So, um, so that, that is an extraordinary thing. Um, but it also is where we experience freedom if we in fact are able to be there. So the amazing thing about mindfulness is that it's a training in returning more and more and more to the present moment. So we have greater and greater access to freedom and to happiness in, so, in our lives on a daily basis. That, that's an astonishing thing. Yeah, fantastic. I think one, one thing that um, you've taught me is that what, one of the things that plays a big part in this is our emotions and feelings. Why is it we? Why is it we don't always feel in tune with our emotions and and uh, and feelings, or or in in fact those of emotions and feelings of those people around us? Why 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 is it some we're so out of tune with those at times? I, I think we get uh, there's something in one of my books. Uh, I, I, uh, I think it's the book that you're you're uh, giving to your your clients. There's a a structure I talk about called the uh, structure of suffering. And what happens when an uncomfortable emotion comes up is we try to uh, kind of confine it or capture it in a way so we can dismiss it. So, but unfortunately, we're not very, we, our, our strategies don't work. So what happens is that we link to that uncomfortable feeling of frustration or disappointment or anger or whatever. We link stories to it. And those links are powerful links. You know, think about how the coronavirus now links onto our cells in the body. These are very powerful links. And, um, and the, the thing that links them is our attachment to our stories about ourselves. So it's it, the I, me, and mine, it's the self that gets linked in there. And um, what mindfulness enables us to do is let go of those stories, let go of the self, and then the feeling can just be there and feelings turn out to be not, not harmful by themselves. They're only harmful when they get linked to stories and to self-identification, when our self-centeredness gets hooked to the feelings. 
then they're dangerous. So could you, could you talk a little bit about how those emotions come on us and how they pass by and the curve of the emotion and, and, and um, some, give us, give us some um, uh, techniques that we can use to allow ourselves to uh, let those emotions and feelings pass us by? Well, the, um, uh, they, they come on, on us quite naturally because clearly we're, we're, we're social creatures. We care a lot uh, and we care so in a good way we care about others and we care about the communities we're in and we're very self-conscious then about are we throwing things off in some way or have someone thrown me off and uh and so that that real sensitivity is is a vulnerability a fragility that we feel inside of ourselves and if we then cling to our self-centeredness around it cling to our thoughts around it we get stuck in arguments and we get stuck in uh, kind of reacting to the situation. But what we learn to do, and we, we teach this in the life planning training, and it's also in a number of my books, what we learn to do is let the thoughts go, but let the feelings be. There's a beauty to the feelings. The feelings, you know, when you hear a beautiful piece of music, you, you can't help but feel. And you can feel a whole range of feelings. You can feel joy and delight, but you can also feel all torn up. You can feel sadness. Uh, and, um, and those feelings have a natural beauty and a natural art. And as we learn to let our thoughts go and learn to let our feelings be, our relationship with the feelings become healthy, become what they're it meant to be, where the feelings inform us and provide for us a music and a, a, a drama that makes life rich. Fantastic. Thank, thank you, George. Um, what I want to do now is um, give you some examples and I want you to uh, help us understand how different people in different circumstances could um, benefit from practice, practicing mindfulness to improve the quality of their lives and the interaction with others. Um, so we'll give this a go. Um, so my first example is um, a busy person, a busy business person who's got a lot going on, but they're about to go into a client meeting to meet a, a client. Well, right there, that moment of transition, if you go, if you leap into a client meeting and you've got lots going on in your mind, you're not going to really be there for the client. And um, so that robs the client of something, but even more, it robs you. It means that you're not going to be at your best. You're not going to be open kind of to your most unusual ideas. Uh, you're not going to be able to kind of think outside the box. You'll just be running on kind of your habitual frames of things. And the other thing is the client, we don't think the client can read us this well, but they do. Um, they can read us very easily. They can read that we're, we're not really there for them. We're, we're not really listening. We've boxed the client in by our questions rather than being really open to who they are. They sense all of that. So, um, so it will help, help your business tremendously, but even more, it's gonna help you be a better person and be a, more authentic throughout all of your life. Right. How about someone who um, participates in competitive sport and wants to perform at their best? <laughs> right now, I'm uh, I'm a huge uh, Boston Celtics fan. You, you you all won't know necessarily who they are, but they're the great uh, basketball team in America. One of the great basketball teams in America, and one of our great stars uh, has been a dedicated meditator since he was I don't know 16, 17 years old. Kobe Bryant, who you've probably heard of. Uh, was a great meditator. Phil Jackson uh, brought meditation to the Chicago Bulls. Uh, Arthur Ashe, I believe, in tennis was a great, great meditator. The, um, what meditation does, because it, again, it brings you to the present moment. So if you want to work on your golf stroke, you want to really be there. And your feelings can, just in a moment, they can interrupt and carry you someplace else where you're distracted. 
Uh, so the more that you are here, you know, Dom with his competitive, I don't know if he does it competitively, but with his biking, you know, you got to be alert. Uh, I know down in Cornwall, he's told me, you got to be alert uh, to what's happening on that road. You got to be really present. And so um, the more that we are physically competitive, the more we want to be really present in every moment so that our body is responding uh, with the tiniest bit of information uh, to, uh, to deliver uh, our peak performance. Um, I don't like on a sideline, but whilst we're talking about that, um, sportsmen always talk about being in the zone. Is there any link between being in the present moment and being in the zone? There, there is, but it, it's, um, I, I think that being in the zone is um, um, not as accurate to what we really want to be. Um, being in the zone in, implies that there's this flow. And if there was this flow, if this flow was kind of rudimentary, was basic to the world, then when we meditate, we would find that flow almost instantaneously. But what we find instead is that the meditation throws us back into the present moment. So what is much more accurate is that we want to be present. We want to continue to bring ourselves back to the present moment again and again. It, but what happens if you're able to do that is that you access, and again, this is in my book uh, on the map of mindfulness, is that you're able to access kind of what I do. I put a, a map at the, at the bottom. Uh, at the top, I have the time and space. It's like an hourglass. And down at the bottom, I have something that I call uh, great peace, great virtue, and great spirit. And that's where the flow is, that if you're able to really master the present moment. You'll still be thrown away and come back, but there will be more of an experience of flow within it. And that comes from dropping uh, your uh, habit of, uh, of selfing, of creating stories about yourself so that you're really just here. I know you've got two absolutely beautiful daughters um, and you probably remember a time when they were very young, very active. Um, so my next example is what about a parent or grandparent trying to put their very active young youngsters to bed? <laughs> well, um, let me let me veer from that because I think this will be just as relevant in a way. You know, we're we're different creatures uh, from our kids. Um, I just had the most amazing uh, summer, even though we were quarantined and, you know, COVID fearful and all that. Um, amazing summer with my family. There are 16 year old daughters. And um, I was engaged with a creative project with each of them. So one of them uh, is very musical. And I wrote songs with her, protest songs about, you know, the earth and golden civilization and all this kind of stuff and what's happening in America. Um, uh, so we were able to partner around that. And my other daughter, I partnered around a bunch of photography. You mentioned that I've done a lot of photography. And my next set of books will be an intermingling of poetry and photography. And so she's developing photographs, and I'm working with her. One of the things I did to make sure that relationship with my daughters was strong all the way through was, you know, you'll see that they're annoyed at you. You know, they're frustrated. You know, you're not on the same wavelength. You don't listen to the same music. You know, whose house is this anyway? And um, what I learned to do was when I saw that they were the slightest bit kind of frustrated with me or I, I with them, is I would spot when they were sitting down on a couch and I'd go and I'd just sit right next to them. And I just would relax. I would just go into the present moment, no expectations. I'd just be present with them. And I'd feel those feelings, Jonathan, that you were talking about. I feel I might feel some fresh for frustration, but primarily I would be moving it toward patience. I would be trying to feel more and more just being authentic, just being myself, and being prepared to listen. So I would want to listen to them the way I would want to listen to you or a good friend or a, um, uh, anyone. So it was really about uh, coming into the wholesomeness of our feeling pl uh, place with great listening and being there with them. And I think that's what I would want, even if I was putting them, to, they were frustrated, putting, the, you know, putting them to bed. 
yeah, you, we want to impose something on them, and there are certain boundaries that are appropriate. But we also want to listen so that um, they know we love them through the whole thing. Uh, even when they go to bed and they're gnarly as can be, you know, we've also given that little bit of love that they know that we're really there for them. Fantastic, George. Well, I think um, it'd, be, it'd be a good point to um, uh, let's, all, let's all try this. Let's all try to arrive at a place where we can go into the present moment. And it would be great, George, for you to, to lead us through a, um, a, a, a leaded uh, meditation um, for, for about 10 minutes, say. Um, and so we can, we can give it a go. How, how, how's that, George? That sounds great. That sounds great. Uh, shall I just dive in and start Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Okay, good. So let me say that the, the book, uh, Transforming Suffering into Wisdom, has lots of instructions. So you'll, uh, you'll see that uh, in, in the book. And I, we're just going to do a, a simple approach to this. What I'd like everybody to do is to uh, find a posture where you're sitting with the back relatively erect and the body at ease. So you're not fearful that you're gonna to have to move to protect your spine or your lower back or your shoulders or your neck. So the body should be at ease, but the spine relatively erect. And it should be a posture where you feel you can sit for 10 or 15 minutes without, um, without worry. So find that posture first of all. And then the second thing that, as you've done this, what, I, what I'd like you to do is see if you can let your th thoughts go. Just right now, just let them go. When, that doesn't mean that they'll go forever. They might come back in a moment to come back at you. As soon as they come back to you, let them go again. And bring your focus instead to how it feels to be in this body at this moment. Just that your whole body, just as if you were feeling your whole being. As if you were just authentically here with your, with your feelings or just with sensations in the body. And close your eyes as you do this so that you're restricting as many distractions as you possibly can. So feeling the whole body and, and allowing, and every time a thought arises, just letting it go. And allowing the body to inform you in a way. I think of it as bringing news to me, bringing the news of who I am in this moment. So let it, let it just bring its news as it has to you for, for decades now. Just what it's like to be here. Just here, nothing, nothing taking you away. And everything that tries, you're just letting it go and coming back to just being in this body, in, in the present moment right here. Just being kind of present to yourself. And as you do this, if you were to do this for a while, you would find that one of the sets of sensations that come to you again and again are the sensations of breathing. And some of you will find those sensations, perhaps because of training or just that you naturally feel them this way at the belly. And others of you will find those sensations more naturally at the nostrils. Wherever they feel uh, clear to you and welcoming to you, present, articulate, Welcome now those sensations in particular. 
continuing to let your thoughts go, but not bringing your awareness to every sensation in the body, bringing them back specifically to where you've chosen now to follow the breath, whether it's at the belly or at the nostrils. And so it doesn't matter how uh, uh, annoying your thoughts are, or how frustrating or how alluring they are to you. As soon as you notice that you're thinking, just come back. Right to the moment of the breath. You may be feeling sensations on the in-breath or on the out-breath. You may feel the temperature of the breath or its movement. The breath may feel like a, a shape, like uh, or a, a have a dimensionality to it. Feel it. Just feel it. Whatever comes your way, feel each moment. Keep returning when the mind wanders to being completely present with this unfolding of the breath. Noticing that the breath certainly has a flow to it, but also keeps changing. Every moment is just a little bit different from the moment before. not attaching to the moment that just passed away or to the moment that you're anticipating, just meeting now the moment that's here. And now meeting this moment as a sensation that you feel that arises and passes away. Resting uh, in the rhythm of the breath. Relaxing into this twofold movement of in breath and out breath. Becoming more and more at ease, perhaps, and at the same time being up for the challenge each time the mind wanders to come back and meet just this moment of breath as it's unfolding at your belly or at your nostrils. Feeling the different sensations of the in-breath and then the different sensations of the out-breath. And knowing that the act of meditation is not staying in the flow, but it's returning to the moment. Again and again. So in this last minute or so of the meditation, notice what has happened as you've followed the breath, the feelings, the sensations of the breath. Notice what's happened inside, inside your, your torso perhaps inside your whole being to the feelings of just being here. And how some of these qualities, what I've called virtues, have accumulated, maybe 
qualities of patience or kindness or tranquility or equanimity or just simply presence. And as you come back and open your eyes, come back to the conversation that we're having, um, see what, what has happened as you engage now with your mind again uh, in the conversation that Jonathan and I are having. Jonathan. Yeah. yeah, thank you, George. Thank you. Um, I, I mentioned, uh, I, you mentioned your book, um, Transforming Suffering into Wisdom, Mindfulness and the Art of In Listening. It's certainly a book I've read, I think, a couple of times. It's one of those, seems to be those uh, bookshelf uh, books that you uh, can keep coming back to. Um, in the title, the title is Transforming Suffering into wisdom. Can you explain to everyone what you mean by suffering and how can we possibly turn suffering into wisdom? Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to take it even further and, and come back and, and go right at it, what you're talking about. Um, I think when I, when I reflect on um, what, what's happened in the world, and I'm just so amazed you know, I'm, I'm 72 years old and I'm so amazed at what, what's happened in the world, all the good things, the amazing things. You know, right now all the scientists trying to figure this, this uh, plague out, it's astonishing. And all the freedoms that we have, it's astonishing. And yet uh, in the 250 years of this explosion that started in your uh, extraordinary kingdom, uh, or uh, the United Kingdom, uh, this explosion of, of, uh, of, of capital, of, of uh, industrial revolution, and all these amazing entities that have been created. One would think that after 250 years, that always at the top of every one of those hierarchies of power that comes into being, uh, there would be wisdom. I mean, why not? I mean, wouldn't the best of our humanity, shouldn't it be arising in every institution? just automatically if, if our institutional life is to be sustainable one would think that it would so i'm very interested in this question of how do we deliver wisdom into civilization because without it we have what economists call negative externalities that come up uh, pollution being the most obvious one of them um, but to come up as a consequence of our systems so um but I mentioned three domains of freedom. So there's civilization, there's the life plan, and then there's this book that you're referencing, which is the book Transforming Suffering into Wisdom through a mindfulness practice. And um, uh, wisdom, I mean, I, I think of it in a, very, in a very deep way, but it's really about uh, understanding the present moment. Uh, uh, selflessly understanding, meeting the present moment, and being aware at the same time, selflessly, of the impermanence that surrounds that present moment. And that may sound abstract, but it's actually very precise. And that present moment is frequently, too frequently for all of us, um, complicated by moments of frustration, of sadness, of disappointment, of anxiety, of, of suffering. And of course, we see major suffering right now with the illness or with the economy. And so the, the question here is in this deep way inside of ourselves, can we master our suffering by transforming it into wisdom? And I would say that yes, of course we can. And that the way that it's done, again, a simplification, but kind of a mantra for it, I mentioned earlier, is to learn to let our thoughts go, which is what we do in any mindfulness practice. We become more and more skilled at letting our thoughts go and letting our feelings be. And when we let our feelings be, we find that our feelings are beautiful things, even our anger, even our despair, that they have a humanity to them that is rich. And we don't act out. We don't take them out on we don't take our anger out on someone else because we understand that it it, it was the, uh, there as a flash 
It means that I need to be more dignified or set a boundary in this situation. Um, but it doesn't mean that I take it out on someone else. It doesn't mean go to war. It doesn't mean intensify the possibility of divorce or of um, uh, or disparage my kids. It doesn't mean that. Uh, or disparage the other party. <laughs> you know, we've got these reds versus blues. Um, so, uh, so I think it automatically leads to wisdom. Uh, and the book is has uh, at least half the book is about the specific inner practice of doing just that, transforming suffering into wisdom. We've got a few questions here. Um, I've tried meditation a few times, and at times it feels really easy. I have a really good meditation. Sometimes it feels nearly impossible and my mind keeps drifting away to other things. What am I doing wrong? Nothing. You've nailed it, man. I mean, uh, th I mean, that's exactly what you want to do. You know, those bad meditations are the best meditations you could possibly have. The good meditations, I mean, that's just easy. It's like being on vacation or something. But you want the bad meditations. Those are the ones where your cutting edge is becoming clear to you and where you're doing the work that transforms them. The work, it might not be obvious that you've accomplished that at the end of your particular meditation, but it means that your cutting edge is coming up. Frustration, anxiety, you know, a particular person, annoyance, and you're given the opportunity to work with it. You may meditate, let's say you're meditating 15 or 20 minutes and you get dominated by what you think of as a bad meditation. Keep going back to the breath. Keep letting your thoughts go and returning to your feelings. And over time, it may be in this meditation or it may be six or seven meditations further on, you'll discover an ease. And your anxiety will never be the same again. Your frustration will never bother you in the same way that it has in the past. You will never find yourself reactive. So what's happening in those bad meditations, as you call them, is your re reactivity is coming up. And as long as you don't deal with that reactivity by in a meditative way, it's going to keep plaguing you for the rest of your life. So that, that's a good thing that they're coming up. Great. Okay. Um, so another question is, what, what does sitting with my eyes closed have have uh, have to do with my job or life in general? Well, um, uh, I, I'm not, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's part of me that just goes, gosh, I don't know. I mean, uh, um, you, you know, I, I, you're, you've broken things down into sitting with your eyes closed, your job and, and uh, life in general. I, you know, I'm interested in being this, you know, a complete human being. And so I've got this interior world that uh, can be quite complex at times, can be quite deep at times, can be really kind at times. I want that in, in inner world to be rich. I'd like to live every moment in freedom, uh, in, a, in, in wisdom, in, in happiness. And what I know from sitting with my eyes closed is that I can do practices that will increase my ability to do that. So then you've got life in general in your job. Well, I don't know about you, but I'd like to be highly functional at my job. So I know that this is going to do that. It's going to make me more fine-tuned uh, so that I'm much more alert, much more focused. And in life in general, again, the more that you're at ease, the more that you're authentic, the more that you're capable of, in a moment of suffering, of acting with elegance and with wisdom and with kindness, gosh, the better life in general is going to be for you. So there's, there's ultimately the answer. It's not sitting with your eyes closed. It's practice. This is work. This is, you're cultivating, just like you'd be cultivating a, a great golf game. You're cultivating your ability to be focused, to be present, uh, to, be, to notice when you, where you're dysfunctional, and to uh, heighten your, your uh, functionality, heighten your effectiveness. So ne next question is, um... Uh, and if any, anyone else has got any questions, please fire them into the Q&A. We, we, uh, we've, we've got George for another sort of uh, 10 to 15 minutes. So please fire in your questions if you've got any further other questions as well. 
Uh, one question we've got is how how long will um, how long will it take for me to notice a difference if I practice meditation on a daily basis? Yeah, um, uh, usually people experience it within a few weeks. Um, they'll notice a difference. They might not notice exactly. I mean, I remember when I first started, I, I knew something was happening, but I didn't know what it was, and I wasn't even convinced that it was good at first. Uh, so it took a little while to notice. And then what I began to notice was that I was more easy with people that would stress me normally. Uh, and, and that was quite, you know, it's kind of like at first just perplexing. What's going on here? So um, uh, it's good to read a book like, like the book that you're, you're going to be delivering. It's good to read uh, about it so you understand what's happening or to look at some of the scientific studies to give you more kind of oomph around it, more confidence that this is what's happening. And that's what I try to do in that book. Fantastic. Um, uh, David Crowe's asked us a question here. We've got, um, I'm interested in your point of view around social em uh, socially embracing wisdom. The moral arc of the universe bends in the right direction and all, except it isn't at the moment across the, wor the world. Perhaps historically we've had good phases and not so good phases. Yeah, fantastic question. Well, I, I think I think we've we've messed up uh, with our structures, um, but we also clearly, you know, I, I I do this wonderful thing, David, and wonderful to hear you. You're on on this call, on this call. We do this um, uh, uh, thing. Uh, I mean, we're one of the things that I've introduced is something that I call a golden civilization conversation, and I've been doing it all over the world and in cultures in, you know, on every continent. And, and in it, we engage with what do, you, what do you want the world to be? And it turns out everybody wants the same thing. You, you could be in rural India, in Africa, in uh, you know, all over the developed world, um, in Hong Kong. Uh, people want freedom. They want kindness. They want vitality. They want... Um, uh, collaboration, they want community, um, they, they want the same thing. So uh, one of the things that I've I've realized is that why don't we why don't we do it? And and when we look at the obstacles, so there's a structure to this conversation. I invite you. You can search me online and find. Uh, I give uh, regular teachings on this. But when we ask people what holds the the community or your culture or your country uh, or your company back. What people say, they talk about external and internal problems. Internally, everybody mentions uh, greed and fear and prejudice. Everybody, all over the world, same thing. Uh, in America, that prejudice right now is being called, is, is talked about in terms of racism. So those three things are the things that come up internally. Now, there are other things that come up, but those three are the strongest. In terms of external, everybody comes up with corruption. Uh, and, you know, there's, uh, you know, institutional, whether it's uh, corporate or government. So I think that we've, the, the mindfulness piece that's happening right now has the potential to soften our arrogance, our, our uh, fear and our greed and our prejudice. So we need to do some internal work, all of us, just to be better and wiser and less reactive. But the external stuff is equally important. Um, one of the things uh, I know uh, some of you are aware of, and this is a little bit more common in America, but also in England, there's uh, uh, something called a fiduciary standard. And in, in our corporate life, I think one of the reasons that we have the negative externalities coming from, uh, from uh, corporate or institutional life is that we've not insisted that that fiduciary standard be toward more than merely the shareholders. That it be that all powerful organizations should have a fiduciary obligation to all stakeholders, to the planet and to democracy and, I think, and to humanity. And I think if they did, and if, if Adam Smith had set this up as part of the structure as we initiated these, uh, these incredible institutions with incredible power, 
we wouldn't have any problems in the world. I think the problems would all go away. Um, so I think there's external and internal work to be done. And I think it's at a very exciting time uh, in humanity and in civilization because of that. I think that the that this polarization that we feel, the dangers that we feel, are really saying it's time for all of us to get busy, join together, and and make something good happen. And we'll do it in different ways. Some of us will have market solutions. Some of us will have uh, government solutions. Some of us will have very personal solutions. I think it's time for us all to get together and say let's let's make it happen. Enough of this battling with each other. Let's get going on it. So that's what one of my passions is that I'm, I'm doing right now in the world. Uh, thanks, David. Fantastic. Thank, thank you, George. Um, here's, here's one of different, I think it's alluring to different types of meditation. But um, uh, the question is, I, I find it uncomfortable to sit for 10 or 15 minutes at a time. Um, can I move around whilst meditating? Um, well, you can. But uh, I mean, again, I'm looking at, at Dom as I'm doing this because Dom does this incredible biking. I'm always very envious of his, uh, of his athleticism. And um, uh, so he's moving all the time. But in order for him to be there, he's got to be very present at the same time. So you can, and I, I do Tai Chi and I do, different, I do different forms of exercise as well. But think, think of it this way. What, what meditation is about is it's training the mind. So if you get this itch to move as you're meditating, that's your cutting edge. That's a flutter of anxiety or a flutter of frustration. You want to go right to it and meet it. See if you can go back to the breath. If you can't, then go to how that uh, anxiety feels. That's where the real growth is for you, it sounds like. It sounds like where the growth is for you is at that 10 minute mark. I'd increase your meditation time. I'd meditate for 20 minutes. Pass through that mark again and again and again. And I, let, let, I've meditated for 50 years. I still feel that, you know, anxiousness about getting to my emails or my text messages every once in a while. But so much more of the time, I'm right here. I just let it go, and I'm able to be here in the present moment and at peace. And I think that's what we want to do. We're imperfect creatures, but we're capable of great growth inside ourselves. One, uh, one final question I've got here is um, around, um, I'm, not, I'm not really sure uh, how I can take this forward and how I can learn how to practice. Are there any good tools or apps that can help me with um, developing a practice in meditation? Yes, there are a number of apps, and I'm not that familiar with them, unfortunately. One of them is called Calm, and one of them is called Headspace. I would just Google uh, what are the best maps for my apps for mindfulness meditation and try each of them out. They're not very expensive. Uh, I'm sure you can, you can probably try them out for free and see which you like. Um, there are also wonderful communities, and I, I'm, I'm leading uh, a weekly meditation class on Wednesdays um, that is available in Europe as well through Zoom, and you're welcome to join us, uh, uh, and, and, and perhaps Jonathan can, uh, can, can share this and hear David Crow saying Insight Timer, and that's a great one as well, absolutely. Um, so... Um, uh, so there are many, and, and as I say, you're welcome to join my meditation group. Meditation groups are very helpful because you're there with, you see the other people and you realize that they're struggling with the same thing and they're growing in a similar way and you get inspired by how they're growing. Um, yeah. Fantastic. And we'll also be um, sending everyone a copy of George's book, um, Transforming Suffering into Wisdom. And I do highly recommend it. It's, it's a uh, it's it's, it's a easy read. It's it's very informative and very 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 helpful. And we you know we'll we'll be sending everyone that's uh, uh, linked into this uh, this call a copy of that book. Um, Dom, uh, I don't know if you you're ready. You'd like to say a, a few words of thanks to George. Uh, you're on mute at the moment, but it'd be great if you could say a few words of thanks for George joining us this evening and um, uh, and. and uh, so we can close the session today. Yeah, hi George, hi from Cornwall. Uh, good evening everyone. 
Um, George, just uh, I, I never fail to learn something when I listen to you. Um, I always find you so interesting and insightful and so much wisdom to, to share with us. So, uh, um, you know, as always, I've got something out of tonight personally. Um, the, uh, you said something very early on about um, that, you know, your passion is, is uh, freedom. And one of the ways that you find that is through mindfulness. Um, but the, 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 the words that kept coming up time and time and time again this evening are, um, uh, were uh, letting thoughts go and letting feelings be and and co always coming back to the breath um just before we wrap up um can you give us some very very quick rough and ready tips on how do we let our thoughts go um, what do you mean by letting our feelings be and my third question sorry to do this to you third question is what is it about the breath that's so important? Great. Um, of course, I could talk for hours on that, Don, but I'll try and do it in a couple of minutes. So, uh, and beautiful, re really, um, really rich uh, questions. So let me address the breath first, the importance of it. Um, uh, you could meditate on many different things. And there are thousands of different varieties of meditation. The wonderful thing about the breath is that it's, um, it's kind of our basic experience of vitality. And it, it is, um, so it, and, and it's very useful that it's constantly changing. That means that we're constantly challenged to be present. And just as it's constantly changing, our feelings, when we feel a feeling, very subtly, they can be changing as well. So the breath is actually close, it's much closer to our feelings than seeing something or hearing something. So it's very valuable, and, and in that way, it's also closer to our experience of our own authenticity which is another way, uh, to me, of saying wisdom, or possibly kindness, or our, our virtues. So the breath is very valuable in that way, and it's something that we can always return to. So you talked about how do you let thoughts go? Well, you can only let them go in the moment. And that means that they, the next moment they might be there again. So you don't want to think that, oh, I'm going to become an expert at letting my thoughts go, and they're just going to be gone. Yeah. Um, it takes, this is what I was saying about it, it takes a practice of returning again and again and again. There's a wonderful Jewish theologian named Martin Buber in the 20th century, one of the greats of Jewish thinking. And he talked about the central spiritual act as the act of returning. And that's what we're doing when we come back to the breath. And we're returning to ourselves. And that's why wisdom accumulates. We're returning to not thoughts about ourselves, but to the experience of ourselves. That's why we started the meditation with just feeling ourselves in our, in our body. And so we, all we do is we just keep letting whatever thought has arisen go and returning to ourself. That's the fundamental thing. The more that we're able to do that, the more we find ourselves kind of resting in our authenticity, uh, in our kindness, in our experience of ourselves. It's just, you know, that's just who, who we are more and more. And that's a wonderful thing to do. And in terms of letting the feelings be, in a way, that's what that's about, the positive feelings, the feeling of kindness or generosity or equanimity or courage sometimes. but. Um, other feelings like anger or you know, anxiety, we want to get rid of those feelings. And it turns out that that's one of the problems, why they keep coming back to us. And in fact, if we can let the thoughts go about it and then feel the sensations of anger or anxiety, 
we may feel them in the belly as a fire in the belly. We may find that our fists are clenching or our jaw is getting tense. If there's any way that we can feel those dark feelings in the body, let your thoughts go and go to those feelings and notice they're just sensations. There ain't yeah. nothing wrong with them. They aren't really problematic. The only problem is how they get attached to our thoughts. Okay. So when you say let the feelings be, it's, it's feeling the feelings. Yeah. So it's not ignoring them. No. But it, it certainly isn't reacting to them other than feeling. That's right. So feeling the anxiety, feeling the anxiety about COVID, for example, because lots of people are, yeah. quite rightly, um, it, it's feeling that, that, that anxiety, that fear, but it's, it's then uh, uh, feeling the sensation of that, but then not actually doing anything as a result of that. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, I mean, you may end up doing something, but uh, in the meditation, you're learning to be at peace with it. Yeah. So that then you have a clear mind when action is called for. Right. I understand. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, George, thank you. That, that's been really wonderful this evening. Um, uh, as I said uh, a minute or two ago, I, I always learn so much listening to you. I, I very much hope our, uh, uh, our attendees this evening have enjoyed that and learned something from it. Uh, and as um, as we've said that we're going to send everyone that's attended this evening a copy of your book, Transforming Suffering into Wisdom. Um, definitely worth a read or two. I think I'm I think I'm up to about three times reading that book. And uh, I've got to say the first time I read it and I was blown away um, and had to read it again to, to, to really sort of get to grips with it and, and learning to. Uh, um, uh, uh, you know, be present and uh, and learning to meditate is. Uh, is a skill that uh, you know you keep you keep keep coming back to. Uh, certainly for me, um, you know I do most of mine when I'm going up some wretched mountain in France, um, <laughs> wondering why my legs hurt so much. Um, and uh, you know the thing I've always learned is when when you're really in in suffering like that is uh, you know is is to smile literally to smile and and say to myself how lucky I am to be able to do this. Um, and all of a sudden that, 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 that lactate in the legs just seems to disappear. Um, so uh, yeah, really good. Thank you, George. And, and thanks again uh, for your time and your energy tonight. It's been absolutely wonderful. Um, wonderful, so wonderful to see you guys. Note, on that note, uh, we wish you much aloha and uh, we'll see you soon, I very much hope. Great. Thanks, thanks everyone. Good night.